Welcome to St. James United Church on the ninth week after Pentecost. I'm Sandra Litt. I'm a licensed lay worship leader with the United Church of Canada, and I welcome you into this time of worship, reflection, and praise. Today, we look at the story from John chapter 6, where Jesus feeds the multitudes and performs the miracle of walking on the water. Let us open in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, blessed are we who come to humble ourselves before you. Blessed are we who acknowledge that we do not know everything. Blessed are we who yearn for your restorative love. We come to be attentive to God's presence, to hear your word, to delight in the teachings of Jesus. We come in the name of the Holy One. Amen. Let us join together in singing, Will You Come and Follow Me? Will you come and follow me if I would call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? As I was preparing for this week's message, I was comparing the New Revised Standard Version to a more narrative style in a Bible called The Voice. Often when I prepare to study a scripture to bring a message, I look at different versions and consider the meanings and the context that they were first written, as well as some of the newer publications and various annotations. At the front of the New Revised Standard Version, there's a section that explains to us, the reader, how this version came about. It was first a revision of the King James Version, published in 1611. And then in 1901, it was revised to the American Standard Version. In 1952, it underwent a further revision to update its language and incorporate discoveries that had been made from the findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's important to note as it says in the front of the New Revised Standard Version, that the Bible carries its full message, not to those who regard it as a noble literary heritage of the past, or those who wish to use it to enhance political purposes or advance otherwise desirable goals. But it is for all persons and communities who read it, so that they may discern and understand what God is saying to them. In order to bring this week's passage from John to life, I decided not to read from the New Revised Standard Version, but from the Voice Bible. The Voice provides us with an understanding of the context of the stories in more of a narrative format. So I invite you to walk along with Jesus as one of his disciples. Be amongst the crowd as one of the observers. Watch and be amazed at some of the miracles that Jesus performed. He fed the multitudes. He walked on water. Let us participate in the wonderment of these great miracles. I invite you to step into the story and listen for what God has to communicate to you. Let us listen to the story told in John 6, verses 1 through 21. Jesus made his way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee which some these days call the Sea of Tiberias. 
As Jesus walked, a large crowd pursued him, hoping to see new signs and miracles. His healings of the sick and lame were garnering great attention. Jesus went up a mountain and found a place to sit down and teach. His disciples gathered round. The celebration of the Passover, one of the principal Jewish feasts, would soon take place. But when Jesus looked up, he could see an immense crowd coming toward him. Jesus approached Philip and asked, Where is a place to buy bread so these people may eat? Jesus knew what he was planning to do, but he asked Philip nonetheless. He had something to teach, and it started with a test. Philip replied, I could work for more than half of the year and still not have the money to buy enough bread to give each person a very small piece. Andrew, the disciple, who was Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, saying, I met a young boy in the crowd carrying five barley loaves and two fish, but that is practically useless in feeding a crowd this large. Jesus responded, Tell the people to sit down. They all sat together on a large grassy area. Those counting the people reported approximately 5,000 men, not including women and children, sitting in the crowd. Jesus picked up the bread, gave thanks to God, and passed it to everyone. He repeated this ritual with the fish. Men, women, and children all ate until their hearts were content. When the people had all they could eat, he told the disciples, Go and collect the leftovers so we are not wasteful. They filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves. After witnessing this sign that Jesus did, the people stirred in conversation. This man must be the prophet God said was coming into the world. Jesus sensed the people were planning to mount a revolution against Israel's Roman occupiers and make him king. So he withdrew farther up the mountain by himself. Later that evening, the disciples walked down to the sea, boarded a boat, and set sail towards Capernaum. Twilight gave way to darkness. Jesus had not yet joined them. Suddenly, the waves rose and a fierce wind began to rock the boat. After rowing three or four miles through the stormy seas, they spotted Jesus approaching the boat, walking mysteriously upon the deep waters that surrounded them. They panicked. And Jesus said to his disciples, I am the one. Don't be afraid. They welcomed Jesus aboard their small vessel. And when he stepped into the boat, the next thing they knew, they were ashore at their destination. The word of God. Thanks be to God for our growing understanding. You know, since the Babylonians seized Judah back in 586 B.C., the Jews have endured one foreign occupier after another in their land. As conquerors go, the Romans weren't all that bad. They did allow the Jews to worship God and go into their temples, and they appointed some of them to government positions. Of course, the Judeans still longed to rule themselves and throw the Roman rulers out. There was some thought that Jesus was just the man to lead that revolution. He wasn't teaching about political upheaval, though. That wasn't his message. If you look at this passage of text, it shows us that Jesus is here to provide. Jesus was there to provide for their needs. And it was through the hands of a child, one of the youngest in the crowd, one of the innocent, that Jesus was able to meet all their needs. Andrew couldn't understand how a child carrying five barley loaves and two fish could help. But Jesus did. He said, bring that child to him and he'd multiply the loaves and the fishes. And when they were done eating, Jesus told his disciples to go and collect the leftovers so as not to leave waste. Through the love of God, there's not just enough. There's plenty. There's leftovers. There's enough to share with others. Another interesting choice that Jesus makes in this story is when he recedes up the mountain just as Moses did in the Old Testament. 
to reset his connection with God. When the people began to misunderstand him, he withdrew from them. What can we understand from this? That we are called to also recede, to recede into that quiet place where God is already there. God is always present. And we're supposed to be aware of when we need to reset. The Spirit resides with us now still, being able to meet our needs if we take time to be open. The example of Jesus helping others deeply inspired Dorothy Day, who was a journalist and co-founder of the Catholic Worker newspaper. In her book, Loaves and Fishes, she wrote, One of the greatest evils of the day among those outside the proximity of the suffering poor is their sense of futility. Young people say, what good can one person do? What is the sense of our small effort? They cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time. Take one step at a time. We can be responsible only for the action of the present moment, but we can beg for an increase of love in our hearts that will revitalize and transform all our individual actions and know that God will take them and multiply them as Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes. The greatest challenge of our day is how to bring about the revolution of the heart. A revolution which has to start with each one of us. When we begin to take the lowest place, and learn from the behavior of the Holy One. We learn to love with a generous and compassionate heart. The miracles that Jesus performed were a revelation back then for the people. Jesus encapsulated and radiated the loving divinity of our Creator. This passage reminds us to not lose sight that these miracles still do happen around us. They are more subtle, and we need to be aware of our own intuition. They come in the form of a loving friend, or a handshake, or a kind word, or a simple smile at the grocery store. They come in waves. They come in the midst of our grief, for in our grief there is the grace of God. For in our comings there are goings, and in our goings there are new beginnings. Jesus, the one who walked on the water, was of great courage and purpose. Jesus invites us to share in this calling, to trust, to have faith, to have hope, to be courageous enough to make a difference, to help those trapped in life's storms. You know, in these current times, I find myself sometimes struggling to stay positive and optimistic. I find myself sometimes scared. And really sad. There is a lot of environmental, political, social, and personal upheaval happening right now. And I wonder how much of all of this is a test to teach us to rise up, to teach us to trust, to live in the spirit, to serve each other, to serve the world. When we see others caught in the storms of life, we must not look the other way. We must not act as though it's someone else's problem. We're all in this together. It's so important to stay grounded in the love of God and to stay surrounded and supported by the Holy Presence. Whether it's taking the dog for a walk, gardening, hiking. Some days it's golfing for me, trying out my new club. Other days it's just sitting outside. Whatever some quiet time means for you. Intentionally take a few minutes each day this week to wait upon that inner, small, quiet voice. Jesus calls you, me, all of us to embody the presence of love to those in need, to walk through the storm with others and help them safely reach the shore. Verse 21, in the words of the risen Christ, I am the one. Don't be afraid. So let us follow the example of the disciples and welcome Jesus 
aboard our small vessel. And before we know it, we will be ashore at our destination. All thanks and praise be to God. Let us lift our hearts in song, singing, I, the Lord of sea and sky, for here I am, Lord. Let us pray. The people cried, there isn't enough. Oh God, we are afraid. We are afraid that we won't have enough, so we hoard our resources. We limit our generosity. The people cried, there isn't enough. We confess our selfishness and lack of consideration for others. We confess our neglect and disconnection with your creation. Forgive us, God. May we all pray for an increase of love in our hearts as we sing together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us today our daily Bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For 
the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May we become better disciples and stewards of this earth. May we awaken to the love that transforms and multiplies through right thoughts, right words, and right actions. All praise be to the one who provides us with enough. The people cried, there isn't enough. And Jesus responded with food for the multitudes. Jesus said, there is enough. Loving God, relying on God, falling into our faith and allowing ourselves to be upheld by the risen one brings the promise of abundant life. So live bravely, live boldly, live faithfully. Live your life out loud with great love. God always provides. Keep focused on the meaning of the miracles of long ago and their message for our lives today. Remember, we are called to live out of our faith. Keep focused on the love of God. Keep moving forwards, wading through the waters of life. 
just one step at a time. Blessings to you, the peace of Christ. Amen and amen.